I'm going to uh, use a weird topic or uh, Bible story uh, to talk about the Christmas story, and it really is the Christmas story. Uh, so let me get into that so I don't go over time. Can't go over time in first service today. Galatians chapter 3, if you've got a smartphone or a dumb phone or a no phone, look on the screen, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter 10. Galatians 3.22 says this, But the Scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So that was promised, being given through faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. At least look, amen. That's good news right there, man. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. We know this isn't going good right now. When you stand up to test Jesus, you might be smart, but you have no common sense. He stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord to God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Jesus said, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? It's a guy next door. Who is it? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law required the man who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now, Grace. Uh, we name our kids Grace. Nothing wrong with that. Grace. Grace is what I crave most when my guilt is exposed. When I'm on the receiving end of grace, it's refreshing. Oftentimes, when it's required of me to give it, it's painful. Grace, when correctly applied, seems to solve just about anything. But yet, grace that is deserved is not grace. We can ask for grace, we can plead for grace, but the moment we think we deserve grace, it is no longer grace. The moment we think we've done enough to earn grace, it's no longer grace. To earn something is to find an equal. A day's work equals a day's wage. But there is no equal where grace is concerned. Grace is birthed from hopelessness and helplessness and bankruptcy in our spirits. Grace is offered to exactly give us what we don't deserve. Grace doesn't dump down sin. Rather, grace acknowledges the full implication of sin, yet does not condemn, but instead offers a way of escape. The need for grace started in the garden. The first book in your Bible, Genesis, the beginning. We get into the second chapter, and there we find God creating men and women. A man first. He said, it's not good that man should be alone. And all of you who are married who didn't find your socks this morning that was sitting right in front of you can... Get that it's, it's good we had somebody. So God created a woman. Her name was Eve. And Adam woke up, went to sleep one night, 
woke up and there was a lady who was in her birthday suit next to him. And he said, whoa, man, that's how you get woman. God only gave them one guideline. One, just one. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat for the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. Lots of yes trees, only one no tree. It's interesting that in the beginning there was a lot of liberty and only one rule. When God had the world the way he wanted it, there was just one commandment. In the beginning, there was no guilt by God's design. In the beginning, there was no condemnation. That was by God's design. In the beginning, the first two people never went to bed at night wondering where they stood with God. That was by God's design. In the beginning, God's expressions of grace were innumerable and his requirements were minimal. Then the decision was made to violate God's command. They ate of that one forbidden tree, and, and Adam said, that woman you gave me, I didn't ask for her. I didn't draw this up. It was not on my Christmas list. I just woke up and she was there. That woman you gave me, she, she, she made me eat this. Because you know, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And so I, I said it's better to eat. I'd rather be at odds with you than her. So he did. And uh, for those of you who just had a child, uh, you know one of the curses on, on women came because Eve ate the apple, and that is that childbirth should be painful. Right? I always said the second longest line in heaven, the first one will be to see Jesus. The second longest line will be women lined up to see Eve and go, how good was it? I may be wrong, but I just, I think... So they, they violated God's commandment. And all of creation was affected and poisoned by that one decision. Think about that. Corruption, death, murder entered in spite of God's plan. That was never God's plan. It was never God's plan for us to get a knock on the door at 2 in the morning and said, your child has been killed. It was never God's plan for us to walk away uh, from a doctor's office going, you only have a few weeks. That was never God's plan. It was never God's plan for someone to take someone else's life. It was never God's plan for that. Never. It was, it was not. But one decision changed all of that. For reasons we don't know, Adam and Eve was not content, content to eat of the abundance of yes trees. It's the appeal of that thing that I can't have, you know? And instantly they became aware of their nakedness and they were ashamed. Shame. I don't read where that was one of God's creations nor his gifts to mankind. Sin created shame, not God. And many people are ruled by shame today and I have to say it's one of Satan's favorite tools. Shame brought hiding. They tried to hide from God in the garden he created. That's about as bright as trying to avoid God by not going to church. Yeah. So God came to them and he played along and he said, where are you? And from there, that moment to the season we're celebrating today, there was a distance between God and man. There was a distance. Man saying, where are you? And then men trying to create systems and procedures and rules and sacrifices and laws to try and please God, to try and draw close to God, try to appease God. And all would fall short and leave mankind empty. Then we read in Galatians 3 that we read, it says, but that was before faith came. We were prisoners to the law, living a life of trying to perform to get accepted making sacrifices that would only bring temporary solutions to our permanent sin problem. Man's attempt to try and restore what was lost in the garden. But that was before faith came. Which leads me to Luke 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. 
You may have heard it preached that the Good Samaritan is a picture of you and I. Now, there's one thing about preaching or teaching, whatever you want to call it. Somebody said you're a teacher, not a preacher. The difference in that is your, the, the level of your voice. Someone asked my youngest daughter one time, uh, what's the difference in a teacher and a preacher? She said, preachers scream, teachers talk. Anyway, uh, there's good principles in any, any scripture that you can use to live by. But I want to put this in context today. And I've seen this for years and years and years, and just thinking about Christmas, I'm like, you know, that's something that just fits this story so well. The Good Samaritan is not a picture, and you would almost think because this, this teacher of the law asked this question that Jesus, even though he says, go and do likewise, it is impossible. It is impossible for this guy to do what Jesus is telling him because he is a teacher of the law. In order to keep the law, it is impossible. So Jesus is just playing his game and giving him something else to be impossible. Right? Because the law was created to lead us to Christ. The law was hard and tough and unkeepable. So the grace of God would look really good. You know what I'm saying? It's like somebody flopping down a, a, a bunch of uh, pig guts in front of you and saying, eat all of this. Right? Boiled pig guts. And saying, eat all this, you're like, yeah! And somebody coming along and setting a big old bowl of a banana pudding bluebell. <laughs> See, the law was like, oh, oh man, I gotta eat this. Yes, you gotta eat this to be in good standing with God. It's pig guts, but it's boiled. Ah. And then Grace coming along and saying, here's a bowl. Just the right temperature. You take that half gallon. I'm going to let y'all in. I've, I've let you on this before, but some of you have forgotten. You take that half gallon, stick it in the microwave. Listen, 35 seconds. The whole half gallon. I didn't say eat the half gallon. You just put the half gallon in there. I want to tell you, that ice cream comes out. You can take that spoon, and it's not too soft. It's not too hard. It just comes in, and it's a right. You know how normally when you get to the bottom of the bowl, it's, and it's good, and then you know what I mean? Well, it's good the whole way now. It's like grace was like a bowl of bluebell that had been microwave for 35 seconds. See, Jesus is, Jesus is showing us something here. We are not the good Samaritans. We or the man who was robbed, beaten, and left half dead. Jesus represents the Good Samaritan. The priest that came by, the Levite that came by, represent the law. This story is such a radical story that Jesus is telling. It's such a radical. We, have to, we, we are Vidorians or Texans or wherever you flew in from. We... we we have to put it in culture. We have to understand this. This is a radical story to who Jesus is telling it to because Jews hated Samaritans. And Jesus is using this Samaritan. And, and, and he uses it and as the one who came to rescue a Jew. That was unheard of. Jesus uses this, this person that Jews hate as the hero to come rescue a Jew. So automatically they're ticked off at the story, you know? Yet Jesus was born in a manger. Get this. His mom and dad were not married. The best explanation his mother Mary could give was, I'm a virgin and I'm pregnant by God. And this baby I'm about to have is going to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How's that for an explanation? You know, go tell somebody that. I'm pregnant by God. Not exactly the picture you would have of the one to rescue us from our brokenness. Thus, Jesus uses a Samaritan to depict himself. 
The priest and the Levite come along. They represent the law. They pass him by. Why is that? Because the law, because rules, because systems, because procedures could not heal my wounds. The law couldn't take care of my sin problem. Culture, tradition, they're all powerless to cure our wounded existence. So they kept on walking. No need to stop and try to do something that you're not capable of doing in the first place. Then there's the man, you and I, humanity. Robbed, beaten, left half dead. Listen, a victim, it's amazing how I use this rob. How many has ever signed up to be robbed? You know, I just think I'm going to go to Parkdale today and get robbed. What's the new thing? Jugged? Jug, hope I'm saying that right. Will they follow you from the bank and bust your window or whatever? Some new deal? How, how many of you go, you know what? After church, I'm just going to go get robbed. I think today's a good day to get mugged. Anybody? Don't raise your hand if, if you think that, because we'll all look at you and go. <laughs> this man is beaten. He's left half dead, a victim of something he didn't sign up for. A recipient, listen, of someone else's bad choices. In this case, us. Robbed of what God wanted for us in the beginning. Beaten by sin's effects. All because of Adam and Eve's choices. We suffered. We got robbed. We've been beaten. We're victims. Because of what someone else chose to do. This man is beaten, left half dead, because somebody jumped him. Somebody beat him. Somebody took his belongings and left him there. He didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for the temptations that I have to fight every day. I didn't sign up for the thoughts I have to battle every day. How about you? I just think I'm going to lust today. I just think I'm going to steal today. I just think I'm going to gossip today. I just, no, we fight these things like, where is this coming from? Anybody else? Uh, uh, this is first service. I forgot. First service is the spiritual ones. They get up early. Second service, they'll all be throwing it up like. <laughs> is there anybody in first service that's honest like, man, where's this come from? Still nobody. Jesus. <laughs> wow. Let's move on. Let's move on. Then there was the Samaritan, the one rejected by the religious society. The man in the ditch didn't know of Jesus. All he knew was religion. All he knew was rules. But the Samaritan, Jesus, he came to me where I was. He came and got down in my mess and my brokenness. And when religious laws couldn't give me hope, Jesus did. When religious laws couldn't pull me out of my mess, Jesus did. When religion, come on, when tradition couldn't give me eternal hope, Jesus did. The law couldn't heal my wounds, but Jesus did. And there was something the law surely couldn't do, and that was pay my debt. But Jesus, the Samaritan, took this man to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day, he took out two silver coins, and he gave it to the innkeeper. See, you and I couldn't pay for the price of our recovery. We were too broken. Then the Samaritan who came said, I've got to go away for a while, but when I return, I'll pay any expense there may be. Anybody getting the Christmas story yet? Jesus was born into this earth a reject. He came to where we were. He paid the debt for our brokenness to be healed, and he had to go away for a while. Three days later, he came back victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And any expense, listen to me, any expense that you and I have built up because of the actions because of our choices, because of what was opened up on creation by Adam and Eve, anything that we've done, even after we were saved. Now, I know you're not going to say yes to this, but I'm going to say it for you. I have sinned since I got saved. I want to tell you right now, 
I fulfilled one of my daughter's bucket lists this week. We went to New York City. I want to tell you, I thought some bad thoughts about some people. <laughs> if you've never rode on a subway, ride on a subway. Ride on a subway. You will think things, and my wife had to tell me a couple times, shut up, George. <laughs> I got reaffirmed on why I'm a country boy, and I like it. I want to say, since I've got saved, I have sinned. Jesus' price he paid said that when I come back, I'm going to pay a price that's going to be an eternal price. And he paid the debt for my sin. Any expense can now be paid forever. And that's the Christmas story. That is it. I know we talk about a manger. I know we talk about donkeys. And I know we talk about no room in the inn. I know we talk about all that. He came as a Samaritan. That religion which the Jews represented, rejected. He came, he presented himself for that. You and I were in the ditch because of somebody else's choices. Listen to me. And what rule keeping couldn't do, I don't know if you've ever tried to keep rules and be perfect, but I want to tell you, you're not going to last that long. And some of you are going, well, he don't know me real well. No, you don't know you real well. Because <laughs> Apostle Paul said, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And he said, there's not one righteous. And somebody probably stood and he goes, well, no, not one. Because there was somebody in the crowd that was about to throw it up and go, what about me? And Paul said, no, not one. None of us are righteous. We're all a product of a choice that was made, in creation's first couple. But Jesus came along and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We were hopeless and helpless. He came and done what the law couldn't do. He was hopeless and helpless. Jesus lowered himself to mankind, came to where we were, born in a major. That was just an entry. What we celebrate today was just an entry into the world to fulfill his mission, and that was to save mankind from their sins. And he paid a debt that I couldn't pay. And three days later, he came back victorious forever over death. Listen, hell in the grave. That's a Christmas story. That's a Christmas story. We've got a lot to do today. I'm going to give some people here a chance to say yes to Jesus. Now listen, listen, I, I, one of the best things and the worst things that can happen to you is to be raised in church. Because I always say this, but it's true. It's easier to learn than unlearn. And for some reason, religion has put into us there is a place that we can get where we're good enough to be accepted by God. That I can reach a point of perfection where finally he'll say, well, come on, you have reached that plateau. There is no place. That's why Jesus did what he did. That's why he came to where we were. There's, you'll, you'll never reach a place to where you go, I'm good enough now. It'll never happen. You say, you know what, I'm probably going to sin again. Well, I've done took care of that one for you. He paid a debt. Right? He said, anything that he owes when I get back, I'm going to pay it. What a Savior. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to pray with you right now. And on this Christmas Eve, 2017, thank God she's gone. 2017. I'm going to pray with you right now. Today would be a good day. For you, listen, before faith came, when we put our faith in Christ, we believe in him, we become his. Amen. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I claim you today as my Lord and my Savior. I acknowledge I cannot save myself. I acknowledge I am the one in need of a Savior. So, Lord, I pray today that what Adam got me into, you'll get me out of. And, Lord, I claim you today. It's my Lord and my Savior. Open up my heart and I ask you to come in. 
I believe that you died on a cross. I believe that you rose in three days and I believe you're coming back to get me. So Lord, today I am yours. Forgive me of all of my sin. Come sit on the throne of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.